Well, hello and welcome to another online Bible study with Pastor Bill Brown, Carmichael Baptist Church. We're going to be looking today at the trial of Jesus. Now, even though we're not going to really be chronologically accurate as far as last week and this week, because last week we looked at uh, Peter following afar off into the high priest's palace where he went in, sat down with the servants, and then left when he was questioned by those servants. Of course, this takes place somewhere in the middle of the trial of Jesus here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record the betrayal of Jesus by Judas and the arrest of Jesus. In the betrayal and the arrest, we're going to be looking at Matthew 26 and verse 47. Not the trial, but it is the arrest. I want you to notice this, what he says. And while he yet spake, talking about Jesus, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves and the chief priests and the elders of the people. This great multitude, I don't think people a lot of times realize it was a pretty good-sized multitude. We're talking about temple guards, no doubt. Maybe there were only 15 or 20 of them, but you add that into a division of Roman soldiers, which was probably about 60 or so soldiers, and then many of those from the Sanhedrin uh, court as well. You're talking about possibly as many as 100 people that were coming and involved in the arrest of Jesus. Both Pilate, the Roman governor, and Herod were in the city. So no doubt there were plenty of Roman soldiers and dignitaries throughout the city of Jerusalem. That great multitude that you read about there arrested Jesus and then passed through the gates of the city and soon came before Annas, the high priest, Judea was under Roman rule, and the Jews had limited powers. They had powers, but they're limited, and we'll look at that. And in this ecclesiastical trial or religious trial, uh, if it resulted in a judgment of death, then a second civil trial had to be required because they had to go before uh, the Roman rulers. Now, the trial, I could have actually entitled this the trials of Jesus because there's really more than one. If we begin to look at the trial of Jesus, we break it down into what I said, the ecclesiastical or the religious trial. Then we also have the civil trial. In the religious trial, we have those included or Annas or the uh, father-in-law to Caiaphas. Annas was the older man and was had been a high priest, and it said that he had other sons, and now this son-in-law Caiaphas. As well as then, too, you have the uh, chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. That makes up the council. That's going to be in the religious. So every time we see that, most of those are going to be included. We have one little preliminary trial uh, that we'll look at. And then in the civil trial, most everyone knows that we have Pilate and Herod. Herod very short in this. Most of the time it's Pilate. But we're going to look at this. And Pilate, of course, would not confirm the death penalty and sent the trial um, to, of Jesus uh, before Herod. And we'll look at that a little bit more. Herod almost immediately sent it back to Pilate who then confirmed later on the death penalty. So we're going to look at those trials or the portions of those trials or how they worked out. As we begin to look at <clears throat> the religious trial, this first starts off with Annas. And this is in the evening after he's been arrested. In John chapter 18, verses 12 and 13, it says, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now you can get lost in the idea of when it calls them both the high priest and uh, 
again, that's kind of a rule or a term of honor. You can get lost in so many different bits and parts of this story that it just gets absolutely amazing. But we're going to kind of dedicate ourselves to the trial at the most. And we understand that as they were coming, uh, this whole mob was coming. They'd already decided long ago to suborn perjury from false witnesses, but they couldn't even find two of them, uh, two men who could stand scrutiny at all. Uh, but they finally did find two of them. And this examination before Annas is not a formal uh, trial, but if we could call it kind of a preliminary uh, trial. Um, it's one of those things that we find in a pre-trial examination. This was, of course, the high priest's palace, mentioned prior to this in Matthew 26 and 58. And so they brought him before Annas and the two witnesses willing and talented enough to lie, or at least to put up with the scrutiny that they would have to do. And they bore false witness against Jesus. John tells us that uh, the high priest is going to ask about his disciples and doctrine. And so we'll see that in John 18 and verse 19. This again is that nighttime trial before Caiaphas and the council. It makes me think that Annas was probably also there as well. And it says, And the high priest and asked Jesus of his disciples and his doctrine. Remember, they're kind of trying to set up a false pretext of really Jesus being a false messiah and an insurrectionist, and he's got a whole crew that are following him. Um, Jesus, of course, responded by telling him, the high priest that, listen, I've taught openly and publicly in the synagogues everywhere I went, and he taught the same things in the temple. He didn't do anything in secret. Ask those, he says, who have heard me. His, he is innocent of any and all charges, and that would be made manifest. Kind of the idea if you would just look and listen and do some examination. Well, when Jesus said that, then a soldier slapped Jesus with an open palm, an insult, and he rebuked Jesus. And then, of course, Jesus asked, if I did anything wrong, you let me know. But he didn't do anything wrong. We also see in Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse 60, at least the part of that verse 60, it says, On the last uh, came two false witnesses, at the last came two false witnesses, and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it again in three days. Of course, we know Jesus was talking about his body. They were saying he was going to tear down the temple of God. And, and then in verse 62, And the high priest rose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? Witness against thee. They wanted a crime worthy of the death penalty that they could bring against Jesus. What happens? Verse 63, But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And at that question, Jesus speaks in verse 64. Jesus said to them, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. It's at that point that the high priest Caiaphas tears his clothes, he rent his clothes, and proclaims that Jesus, he says, what think ye, looks around at the council, what think ye? They answered, said, he is guilty of death. The soldiers and the servants then spit in Jesus' face. They mock him, they blindfold him, they plucked off his beard, and they hit him. We read that in verse 67. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hand. And, of course, what did they do? They said, if you're a prophet, of course, they put a blindfold over him too, over his eyes. Who hit you? Mocking him. 
Luke tells us this in Luke 22 and verse 65. He says, and many other things blasphemously spake they against him. What we read about in the Gospels, putting all these stories together, is just a very small sample of the ridicule, the mockery, and the blasphemy that they spoke against Jesus Christ. It was the priests, the elders, and the scribes who were blaspheming, not Christ. It was Annas and Caiaphas who were guilty of blasphemy, not Christ. They have found Jesus guilty of their manufactured crime, and their sentence is death. But in fact, they were the ones guilty of blasphemy, not Jesus himself. Then, what do we read? The trial in the daytime. They had one in the night, and then the next morning. In Matthew 27 and verse 1, it says, When the morning was come, so they held him in jail, or however they held him bound. But this says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. That was their plan, and you'll see more about this. In fact, Luke tells us in 22 and verse 66, says, And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him to the, into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And then he says, If I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Notice verses 70 and 71. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, What need we any further of any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Notice the very next verse, which is chapter 23 and verse 1. And it says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. So we see how that the ecclesiastical or religious trial went. It wasn't fair. They had a desire simply to seek to put Jesus to death. And then, because they could not, they took him to Pilate. Before Pilate, then, we'll look at the civil trial. In John 18 and verse 28, it says again, Then they or led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early. And then themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but they that might eat, uh, but that they might eat the Passover. Now Jesus, of course, is taken from the palace of the high priest into the judgment hall. This Jews are forced, in this case, to bow to Rome, but they must use the power of Rome, because the Roman government was the only one that could issue an order of execution. Two, notice how severely distorted in their own perception they were of themselves and their sin. They won't go into the house of a Gentile believing that they would be defiled by it. And yet they don't realize that they've already been defiled by what they are doing. They cannot see their own sin and the sin that they must own for all of eternity unless they seek forgiveness. The Lamb of God is being examined. And while he is the one that is before them without spot and without blemish, without any sin, they claim that he is worthy of death. Well, what do we know is that the innocent will die for the guilty. The Lamb of God is there to take away the sin of the world. But that generation of religious men, the most religious men of that day in Israel, must bear the guilt of seeking the death of the Son of God, God the Son.
You get the picture? Can you see it? That great crowd approaching yet refusing to enter. They made known the matter some way by appearing in that great multitude. So then what happened? We see in John chapter 18 verse 29, it says, Pilate then went out unto them. They're not coming into him, so he goes out. He bends. He goes out to them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? He could see that they had someone come. He could see that they had someone bound as a criminal. They could see that someone was being held by the guards and beaten and probably bloodied even at that time. Verse 30, And they answered and said unto him, If he were not a male factor, would we not have delivered him up unto thee? So why are you bringing him? Well, we're bringing him because he's guilty of a crime. We wouldn't even be doing this if he wasn't guilty. In other words, the idea is they wanted Pilate to give up his right of trying this case and hearing all the facts. They wanted him to just simply accept their judgment. Verse 31, Then Pilate said unto them, Well, if that's the case, take ye him and judge him according to your law. You take him, you deal with him. But what did they do? The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which spake signifying what death he should die. That had to do with crucifixion. They wanted him to die a cruel and unusual death at the hands of the Roman government. Pilate refused their plea. Here's the catch again. It's not lawful, though, for us to put a man to death. They were now forced to admit. I'm talking about that council, the high priest, the chief priest, the scribes, and the elders were forced to admit their entire design in bringing Jesus before Pilate was to have him put to death. Their design was actually outside of their rightful boundaries. They wanted him dead, and they were making sure that the notice was now official. In verse 33, Pilate, then it says, Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Matthew tells us in this arraignment that they hurl accusations against him. It became intense and hateful. No wonder he went back into the palace because there was probably so much rancor, so much loud verbal hatred coming from those men that he couldn't even think straight. That's why it says he took them in. But in so much, it says that he did not answer a single word. In so much, it says that the governor marveled greatly. Then Pilate sat in his seat of judgment. I mean, think of the irony of that statement in itself. A sinful man, a wicked sinful man, will now sit in judgment over the sinless one, the just one the perfect one, the only one that's ever been on this planet that has been born sinless and stayed sinless. This man, God the Son, will one day sit in judgment over all men. Then let's look a little bit further at this interrogation. Because art thou the king of the Jews? Pilate asked him directly. And Jesus asked him if this was his question. Or was this question provided for you by somebody else. Pilate then skips to the chase and asks Jesus, What have you done? What hast thou done? Without responding to that, Jesus responds to the original question. And he tells him that my kingdom is spiritual. My kingdom is not temporal. I am no rival to the Roman Empire. Notice then Jesus' response and Pilate speaking to him, because Pilate in verse 37, it says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. Here it is, though. To this end was I born, 
And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And notice this, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He's not just talking about hearing with the ear. He's saying, yes, I am the king. That was my purpose of being born into this body. This was the reason why I am the incarnate one, to give witness to the truth. For the fact is that Jesus is the truth. He didn't begin the day of his birth. He was the promised Messiah from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And then he says, everyone that is of the truth hears my voice, not with the physical ears, but with spiritual ears. We recognize the voice of the Messiah. We can see that he is the Lamb of God. We know him as our shepherd, the one who called us by name. That's why we can read in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Well, Pilate was dismissive of the words of Jesus. He turned and he went back out to the Jews. The chief priest and the scribes and the high priest did not like hearing Pilate's judgment. What did he say? He said, I find in him no fault. He's no rival to the Roman rule of government. He also hears in this discourse that Jesus is a Galilean and immediately sends Jesus to stand before Herod. In Luke 23 and verse 7, as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Well, Herod and Pilate were not at all close to one another. In fact, there was some, an incident earlier where in Luke we find that, in fact, that's 13 and 1, where uh, Pilate disrespected Herod's jurisdiction when he killed some Galileans in a religious celebration. But because of this interaction, because Pilate recognized Herod's jurisdiction, he was making nice, and Herod was making nice back, what did he do? He dressed up Jesus in a gorgeous, he says, robe, and they were now friends. Pilate understands enough to know the Jews were not truthful when they brought the charges against Jesus before him. They had a hidden motive. Though it's never been said so far, he knows what it is, and he begins to use the custom of the Romans in dealing with the Jews to appease the Jews. Matthew exposes this motive and this offer of freedom or prisoner when he says in Matthew 27 and 18, for he knew, talking about, well, I forgot about that verse, and Herod with his men of war set him at naught, forgot to read that one, and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, sent him to Pilate. The same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together for before they were at enmity. Let me take you now to uh, Matthew 27 and verse 18. What does it say about Pilate? He knew that they, for envy, they had delivered him. It was fake charges that they were bringing up. In fact, Pilate said again, we talked about it just a minute ago, ye have a custom that I should release unto you at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Of course, he'd given them an option. He gave them an option that he thought would be clear, that they would undeniably release Jesus who had none of these charges proven. But they had another one, a rotten man, a murderer and an insurrectionist by the name of Barabbas. And what did they do? Then cried they all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. Let me keep reading because I want to give you more of this story. Pilate tries to convince them and he says, listen, I will therefore chastise him and release him. I'll do that. How about that? But what did they do? Down to verse 
21, but they cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. Both Herod and Pilate have judged this man not worthy of death. And again, Pilate says, I will chastise him and let him go. And then in verse 23 of Luke 23, it says, and they were instant. They didn't wait a second, but they with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and the chief priest prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. In Mark's gospel, we read this, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And I'm not going to read all the verse, every part of the verses, but it says, And the soldiers led him away into the hall, and they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it upon his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. This was all in mockery. And when they had mocked him, Mark 15 and 20, when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. The trial of Jesus leading up to his death, his burial, and then praise God what we will study next Sunday, the resurrection. May God bless you and help us to see the truth. May we hear the voice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and who died for us and who has called us by our name. God bless you.